Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, my guest is Chris Allen of Adventure School. Chris, how are you today? Doing awesome. Thanks for having me on, Matt. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. I, uh, as with most folks that I'm getting as as a, as guests these days, is through the uh, the Instagram community and uh, your, as I you know verbalized to you through uh, the the through the DMs. I'm really resonating with your content. I love the idea, Adventure School. I'm actually kind of surprised that you were able to get the URL, myadventureschool.com. It's still available. So, you know, good for you for that. Just Adventure School coaching, that whole idea. And, you know, like, I, I mean, you probably saw anybody that, that's been listening to my show, the whole idea, like the like the mountains and the stream, the drawing that I have as my, uh, you know, my cover for the podcast and my, and what I was ta- telling you before we get started, like, how adventure and just being out in nature has been a huge part of my sobriety and recovery journey. So just as soon as I came across your uh, content, I'm like, oh, I got to reach out to this guy. So I really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you for reaching out. And uh, it's it's great to connect with people who, uh, who have the same passions in life that I do. So excited yeah. to get chatting here. Definitely. Yeah. And I want to get into like your whole origin story, the origin of your business and such. But before we do, like, let's just get right into it. like adventure school like what is it are you doing group coaching is it like an online thing just give us a little bit more information about adventure school yeah um i won't go into all the origin story at this point but just the quick snapshot um i'm i do one-on-one coaching primarily and i have a signature package that's eight weeks long and that's focused on helping people really escape the the mundane lifestyle just you know spinning the hamster wheel chasing money chasing things chasing uh, accomplishments and self reaching a level of like self transcendence where your life matters beyond just your own ego and your own self. So that's the goal of this eight week program. Um, I do one-on-one coaching with other people that don't necessarily want to jump into that specific program, but are just looking to kind of find more adventure and excitement in their life. Um, that's the main piece of the the business. The website has kind of a a mixed bag because I've transitioned it over time to be coaching. Um, And we can talk more about that as we go, but the evolution of these things is, uh, is ongoing. What is it about adventure that resonated with you to the point that you're like, I'm just curious, like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like were you a coach before, you know, you were into uh, like integrating this idea of adventure into your coaching or were you at the stage where you're like, okay, I'm a, I love going to doing the outdoors. I see an opportunity to become a coach and you just merged the two and went with it. Like what, what's uh, how did they come together basically? Yeah. So in order to kind of go there, I might have to go back a bit and we'll, sure. we'll dig into the the whole story here, but so growing up, I've always been an avid adventurer, you know, grew up on a mountain bike and whitewater climbing in the mountains, all these things. I was just part of who I was It's part of my family, part of what I did. And so um, that became kind of my identity, you know, and um, going through life, growing up, uh, did all kinds of crazy stuff, adventuring, pushing the envelope, skiing and climbing mountains but um I kind of at at some point when I was so after college married had a couple kids um my life totally changed and this is all on some of my Instagram stories but I'll go into a little bit more detail here um I got really sick Mm. and I over a a period of about a year and a half um, I was so sick that I couldn't walk. I was in a wheelchair. Um, I couldn't work. I, basically, my activities for the day meant I was going from the bed to the couch and then back to the bed wow. <laughs> as, as much as I could do. I couldn't even like hold up a book to read because one, my hand would get too tired, but also my brain would just, it, I didn't have the energy to to read and process stuff. And nobody really knew it was wrong. I was working at the Mayo Clinic at the time. And you'd think, you know, Mayo, they'd be able to figure it out. World-class experts. uh, No, they couldn't figure it out. And eventually they just kind of gave up on me. And they said, sorry, you're just going to have to learn to live like this. Um, And through that process, I had to redefine who I was. 
because like I said before, my identity before was being active and being mm-hmm. outdoors and physical um, exercise and things like that were really important to me. But that disappeared. I couldn't do any of that. Mm-hmm. So I had to dig deep inside and understand more at a more uh, core level of who I wanted to be because I had to kind of bury that old person. And I think that happens to so many of us in different ways, whether we choose to do that or we're forced to do that. You know, sometimes we get stuck in bad habits and and patterns that cause us to kind of lose it all, right? Whether that's Mm. addiction or some other process, we end up in jail or or, uh, we end up losing relationships or careers. And I think that's a similar sort of situation to where I was in. It was forced upon me here and it wasn't by any choice that I made, but certainly I, I had to question myself and what really mattered in my life. It's a powerful, you know, powerful story as far as how you, how and why you, you got into that whole aspect. And I love, like you say, there's like the layers or like the metaphors of like, you know, there's literally f- physically and mentally happened to you. And now you're resonating with people where it's, uh, you know, where it's like, I'm looking at your Instagram right now. Like, are you living on autopilot? There's like this idea that I think when you get into an adulthood, there is part of you, like the curiosity, the enthusiasm of like being a a younger, like whether it's a child or even into your teenage years, you're talking about all the exploring that you were doing, um, where some folks don't go through that literal condition that you went through. But there is that like more gradual kind of insidious uh, way of going through it. That being like, you know, you get kind of numbed out with an addiction or addicted to achievements and you get really away from that, you know, playful side that you perhaps had as a, as a youngster. So I love how you, you, you are like modeling the actual, like your life was taken from you in a lot of senses. So you can speak to how important this is. You've had that perspective. I'm imagining you're having a lot of people that are coming up to you with more of like that metaphorical or like a a slower, slow burn, as far as like their life is, you know, they're looking back, say they're 30 and they're looking back and be like, man, those last 10 years, like I didn't enjoy myself at all. I'd like, yeah, I'd like you to talk about like what kind of people are coming to you and what state of mind that they're in, uh, you know, when they're, when they're reaching out to you. Yeah. Yeah. I can go into that. I'm going to go back and kind of connect the dots here a little bit too. So I did get better as you can see on my Instagram, uh, we were able to figure out what was wrong with me. So now I just have to do my daily medications and I'm good. Um, and that led me back into like this, this life of activity, but on a totally different mental state. Right. So before I was just chasing, uh, adventure adrenaline, right. I was just kind of the adrenaline junkie guy. Let's go hit the big cliff or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. But now I approach life with a totally different mindset of, you know, what's the purpose behind it and and what am I trying to accomplish? And that led me into this coaching world where uh, I did this professionally in my, my um, job that I had a career working in laboratory medicine, you know, climbing the executive corporate ladder thing. And I, I was trained as a professional coach there and did a lot of coaching and mentoring at work. And based on, where my life came from to where it is, I decided it's so much more meaningful to, to help other people reach the kind of same state of mind that I'm at and still continuing to work on and build every day. But um, so now I'm doing the coaching thing. And what I find, like you were asking, most of the people that are, are resonating with that and coming to me are uh, kind of middle of the life, middle life mm-hmm. folks who, you know, they've had a good career reach some accomplishment. Many of them have overcome obstacles such as, you know, I have addiction or other um, problems, failed relationships, divorce, things like that, um, where they've kind of had this aha moment, like, hey, there's more to life than just running around chasing money or, or, you know, checking all the boxes that we're told we need to check, going to school, getting a degree, uh, getting a job, buying a bigger house, getting a car, you know, these are all things that we're told are going to make us happy. They're going to, they're going to drive us to feel this pleasure and this fulfillment in life. And and in reality, if that's all you're doing, it's empty and it's hollow. And so a lot of the people that come to the end of this rope 
and they're hanging on this rope and they're saying, Hey, where's the, where's the gold at the end of the rainbow that I was promised? It's not mm. there. And so I'm offering a new perspective and a new view that allows people to stay in the life they're in for the most part, unless there's destructive habits there. Uh, but, you know, keep the same job, stay in the same house, whatever it is, you don't need something bigger and better and shinier to find meaning and purpose and uh, live a life that matters. So yeah, people, people are coming for that. It's been a good, good, uh, good offering that I feel like I've figured out for the most part. Yeah, very cool. I'm curious uh, about, you know, we, when we obviously the show is about like addiction and recovery and such. And we were talking a little bit about it before we started. I'm imagining that there are some people that are looking to remove a certain aspect of like a negative habit that they have and then displace it with this uh, much more fulfilling uh, you know, sense of adventure and such, right? Are you getting people that are like, Hey, like I've tried numbing it out. I've, I've tried these other addictive behaviors. This isn't working for me. And I guess, yeah, the topic of like displacing that with this, um, uh, you know, this adventure and, this, <laughs> like, you know, it, n- nature exposure and such like is what, what is uh, the relationship that you've had with clients as far as that goes? Um, yeah, you, you kind of nailed it. You know, I've got, uh, tons of clients that have come to me with addictions or behaviors that they're trying to get rid of. Example, I worked with the lady just this past uh, month that she came and she said she was uh, suffering from retail therapy, right? Mm, so wow. she's addicted to shopping, just, mm. you know, she would get on the phone and Facebook or whatever emails would be better. She had all the shopping apps and all the deals would pop up and she'd just buy stuff yeah. for the thrill of buying it. And I think whatever that addictive behavior is, oftentimes we're, we're trying to fill a hole in ourselves that we don't even know exists. Right. And so a lot of what I did, you know, with people like her, others who have suffered through some of these things is they don't know how to get out of it. And so it's, let's, let's uh, do some exercises together to help unravel what you're trying to fulfill. What base needs are you trying to meet? with those behaviors. And so like in her instance, it was, it ended up being this kind of fear. It was all based in fear of controlling her environment. And it's weird how those connected, but they connected. And she, once she recognized that she was able to say, Oh, I don't really need that to fulfill my uh, base needs. But what she did need was more time to, uh, be in her own head, right? She needed mm. to be able to like, I guess we call it mindfulness. I don't really like that term the way we use it, but um, yeah. she really just needed a, a chance to think about the way she was thinking, yeah. to be aware of herself, right? And that is one of the main reasons I uh, point people to nature. Yeah. Um, I, I think nature is one of the number one places. For me, I don't sit and meditate, I don't pull up my pillow or anything. I go, I go on a run, I go skiing, I go biking. And that puts me in that like Zen, like state of mind where I can just be with my thoughts. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't have to think about anything else around me. Mm -hmm. And I go out kind of a lot of times I'll point people out with like a specific purpose. Like today, I want you to go on a walk in the park and I want you to just think about, uh, you know, why you, um, work the job you do, you know, just as an Mm. example, Mm -hmm. and people will ponder that and just letting their minds wander in nature provides us this curiosity and this creativity to kind of understand our thinking. So for me, nature is a a healing uh, outlet and it's a place for us to connect with ourselves and escape um, the ego of Mm. that comes with the world. So um, there's, there's one exercise I sometimes have people do. And that is like, I call it the ordeal. (laughs) And it's like, go out in the woods for like three days, no Mm. electronics, no connections and see what, see what happens to your brain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Things change. And, and so, yeah, I think nature and adventure um, are ways to understand ourselves better and to be able to show up as more human and more connected to others. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, you know, there is, there's so many studies, right. And I'm sure that you've, you've, you, you know, you've done a lot of these. I, I think there is like an ebook or uh, audiobook. Sorry. I, I saw an audible about that, like exactly that three days in nature tech free. I don't know necessarily know if it was like to, to the extent that you mentioned, but even just going out as a group, you know, leave your cell phones with somebody that you trust and just see what happens. You know, the 72 hours of that, you know, I've heard quotes of like um, move at the, at the pace of nature, you know what I mean? I, there's like, I think there was a study that I'd read about, you know, there's just enough stimulation when you're out in nature to keep you, st you know, st stimulated, but it's not over stimulation. Right. So it is like you say, and I, I really like the, uh, what you mentioned, you're not a meditator, but you found this way to do this, essentially like a moving meditation, right? A lot of people still a little bit off put, uh, you know, or by practicing, just sitting there with their eyes closed, uh, you know, quote unquote, doing nothing. Whereas you can get a lot of the same effects as far as like what you're talking about, the thinking about your thinking, but in a state of like you say, biking or just walking out in nature without your phone, you know, and you can get a lot of that same style benefit of being able to get that awareness. And it can be, you know, uh, uh, the side benefit of being out in the sun, you know what I mean? And connecting with nature, right? Oh yeah, so many uh, scientifically proven health benefits of connecting and being in nature, uh, and <laughs> all the advantages of meditation for me too. It has to be an activity that you're very confident and comfortable with, right. um, something that you don't have to think about. Right? You can just kind of turn on your your autopilot brain and do it. But um, yeah, everybody can do that pretty much with walking. If you go on a walk on a trail, you're familiar with at the park or whatever. Um, yeah. How do you identify, uh, you know, what somebody needs, you know, your coaching being very customizable and such, uh, you know, uh, like you mentioned, I love that you, you gave a specific example, a case study of this lady that was doing shopping therapy, you know, and, uh, and figuring out something for her. So how is it that you figure out something like if somebody's like a, a homebody, you know what I mean? That has like a sedentary lifestyle, they sit behind a computer all day. They're not really big into, uh, like, or they think they, they have this perception that they're not really big into like going outside, but it's definitely calling to them. Like, how do you navigate that? Like, what is like a, I guess, an intro level step for somebody that's like fearful of going outside even? Yeah, see, it's a great question. So um, my coaching methodology is just start where you are, start where the client is, right? So if they're, I, I have a client right now who's like a big skier and he's, skiing double blacks and all this stuff and so leveling him up to something else is part of his his goal with me and that's to do backcountry skiing you know learn the avalanche safety and all that so um he, i started where he's at and most people aren't going to be on that level but that's what he's ready for another client um doesn't really get outside much uh she she walks her dogs around the block um, mm -hmm. that's about it. And so for her, I've got, like I d described earlier, she's got a local like nature park that mm. it's a couple acres and it's got a little paved path that goes around it. And she's going there for her kind of outdoor, uh, connection and like the ordeal I mentioned, you know, get out in nature for her, that's like renting an Airbnb cabin in the woods. So mm -hmm. she's got, you know, all the safety and luxury, but just disconnecting, you know, yeah. pulling the plug, not connecting to the Wi-Fi, all that stuff. Mm, that's super cool. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You talked to, uh, you've mentioned a few times, like this idea of like the ego and like identity and such. Um, how has that shown up for you? Like I imagine a big, well, you said the death of your identity in a way was that condition that you received. Um, what is your relationship with ego nowadays? And yeah, I'll start with there. Yeah. Uh, you're right that I did have to reconstruct myself when I, when I was sick, but um, I still maintained, you know, I came out of that and I, I had to go chase a career and get all these degrees and stuff. It wasn't till later in life that I kind of looked back and realized this. And that's pretty common. Most people aren't ready for that until they're a bit more mature. They've had some life experience. Sometimes, you know, people come out of the gate and they're ready to kind of face the ego and, and just defeat the ego or, or, uh, eliminate the ego, so to speak. But um, yeah, for me, I think identifying a higher meaning in my life and realizing that 
I myself and the way I appear, the way I show up to other people doesn't matter in regards to how I, how I look or how I come across. It's really in how effective I am at helping other people. Mm. And so it's wow. a level of self-transcendence. Uh, and I have a webinar that's linked to my, uh, in my Instagram page, there's a link. If people want to go there, there's a webinar that I talk more about this self-transcendence, mm. yeah. but uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're familiar with that, it's got like five base needs, mm -hmm. but there's a sixth need that he published. Uh, he wrote about and never got published till after he died. And that's self-transcendence. And mm. that's escaping the ego. That's this higher level of living that I, my program helps people achieve through breaking down all these components of the ego and understanding why they matter. And then reformulating that to, to understand that they don't really matter in the end, if you have something more meaningful to live towards. Uh, so many of us are just so worried about what other people think and how we show up and how impactful we're going to be on that level. But once you can escape that, your impact multiplies uh, by a huge margin, just because you're not worried about yourself, you're focused on other people. Yeah, like a contribution or service type um, yeah, a perspective on it. You know, I know it's, why do you think that there is so much of a, like this conditioning around, you know, like achievements, like you talked about earlier, like, you know, you, you know, get to the top of whatever job you're in, get the house, get the partner, get the family, you know, it's just, that's, it's been almost uncontested, uh, and as far as the framework and have been conditioned into us as humans for, you know, generation after generation and such, like, why is it? Yeah. I'm just kind of curious more. I'm not sure if I have a question about it just more as a topic. Like, yeah, I, there's a question like why, why, why has that been such a, um, a focus for us as a society? And like, I'm kind of like, as I'm thinking of this one, pondering it, like I imagine that was like the height of like society for the longest time. And now we're growing into this like time where we have this, uh, a lot more awareness and a higher consciousness and such. So but I'm just kind of interested in your take, like why has achievement been such a sought after thing? And then you've yet, we've had so many people that have identified that that's not, you know, that's not the, the best way to live. Yeah. It's a great question. And I think that comes and goes in waves throughout, throughout time, you know, they're, enlightened periods you know the philosophers and such where uh, they try to teach this and some people get it some people don't and here we are in this age of rebirth of stoicism right where stoicism's huge and and it's like this is really old stuff and we're still trying to figure it out right. um i think the root of your answer is that it's it's genetically programmed into us so if you go back to maslow's hierarchy of needs those things really are important. You know, the base level is physiological safety. We need air, we need food, we need water. And then on top of that, we need shelter. Um, and then, you know, we need human connection and we need, we need to feel like we matter. We need to feel like we fit into a group or a tribe. Those are parts of our safety uh, mechanism that we have programmed genetically so that we can survive as an individual and as a species. The problem is we have a hard time escaping that. So we do need a home to go home to, right? You do need a safe bed to sleep in. You do need to, to have the knowledge that you're not going to be evicted and you're not going to be become a refugee tomorrow morning in order to function at a high level. And a lot of people in society don't have that. And so it's a constant fear we live with. Uh, I lived in the Philippines for two years mm. and the Philippines, you know, where I was at, um, it's one of the poorest places in the world. Mm. And so I met with people every day that were, <laughs> they were living at this base level of survival, but yet they were so fulfilled and happy because they were able to break free from that cycle in Western world. The consumerist, uh, capitalist society tells us that you need all these things to be happy. You need to have more to be fulfilled. You need a bigger house. You need to compare yourself to the next guy. You need to make more money. You know, And so this comparison exacerbated by social media yeah. uh, drives that, that needle 
that bar that we're trying to hit mm. so far down the road that we think that we need more than we actually do. Yeah. And when we can take a step back and realize that, hey, you know what? My needs really are satisfied and then some beyond what I need. I've got a, a huge house compared to people that I know in the Philippines. You know, their house is the size of this couch rectangle behind me. Yeah. That's where they yeah. live. And and right. so, you know, when you when you can see that and and understand that you really don't need all this stuff, then you can um escape it. It's just awareness, really. Yeah, definitely. That's a very thoughtful answer. You know, I, I I'm thinking of it as yeah, awareness is definitely the key. Like it's um, you know, there's like uh there's a gap between how I perceive there's like a social expectation or how I perceive it to be. And then there's yeah, when I when I'm actually able to take a step back and be become aware and focus on what I actually have and what I'm grateful for. And then there's this like seemingly like a big gap between that. And I, and I've spent a lot of my life with that conditioning of like the shoulds and the supposed to, I should be higher it, you know, whatever in my life, or I should be at this stage in my life. As soon as I say should or supposed to, I'm like, okay, well, where's that energy coming from? That seems to be like an external thing that I'm reacting to versus when I actually take a moment and maybe, you know, whether it's the meditation or going out into nature uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, I'm more at my, with myself at that time. And then I can't help but think about all the, you know, this, the things that I do have. And as soon as my brain's thinking about that, it's like the brain is the Google search engine. You, you plunk that what I do have into the search engine, it brings up all these articles about, you know, things that I do have. And then it's like, it's, but yeah, it's interesting, right? There's like that duality or like that gap between, you know, societal expectation or pressure that I perceive and then just how con content I'm actually am with my life. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're right there. The societal pressure is huge. And we're, if you're plugged in to any sort of media, you're getting a, a kind of unconscious subconscious message that you don't have enough all right. the time. That's all it is. And and one of the hmm. tricks is to learn, to be aware of that, to recognize the messages that you're getting, call them out for what they are and channel it somewhere else. And that somewhere else, like you said, it's that your brain's the Google search engine. And if you're plugging in all the things that you have and all the things that you're grateful for, uh, all of a sudden life changes. Gratitude is this like magical key that most people don't use. Um, we, we think we're using it oftentimes, you know, there's a lot of, uh, practices, prayer practices where we express gratitude or, you know, these daily affirmations where we list off, rattle off a bunch of things we're grateful for Thanksgiving time, you know, we do that, but we don't really understand <laughs> as a culture in general, most people don't do this to a level that really will change their lives. And for me, I had a friend that just asked me the other day, uh, he said, you know, Chris, how do you, uh, how do you maintain your health so well um, over all these years? You know, you've gone through, you've, you've had such a health crash, but like, I'm, I'm not like addicted to working out. Like some people fall into that trap. Right. And it's a daily thing for me. It's a really healthy relationship. And so he was just, we were curiously chatting about it. And I think the answer that I gave him was that I am every day grateful for my health mm. I'm every day grateful for my physical body. And because of that, I'm consciously aware of how I take care of it, how I treat it. And yeah. um, that gratitude brings we if you study gratitude at all you learn gratitude attracts more of what you're grateful for right and it, it's a true principle um so i think escaping that comparison that uh need to fill all these uh, holes in our soul that we think are there the answer is to learn how to be grateful and curious yeah i love it two of my favorite words grateful and curious yeah i like that i like that i wanted to give you an opportunity because i know we uh we touched on it but if there's any other um you know uh spaces to fill as far as um you know, more a little bit more about your origin story is obviously very uh uh impactful as far as like what you had gone through and you gave a little bit of background as far as like your upbringing and, and what you sought out as far as adventure and such uh early on I just wanted to give you an opportunity to cir circle back if there's anything else that was, uh, you know, profound or that would give folks some background just on you and and why, you know, why, what makes you tick basically. 
Yeah. Well, um, see what will be, will be relevant here. I've got a lot I could say. Yeah. I, I come from a, a pretty big family. I've got six kids in my family. Um, I had one of my brothers died when I was eight, he was two. And that certainly, uh, impacted me, um, in a way that I have a, <clears throat> like a, a connection with, um, death, right. Yeah. And the impermanence of life. Right. And because of that, I think I, I have a, so two, two elements here. One life is short. We never know when it's going to end. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be, you know, when we're 90, but I think the important part there is that don't, we shouldn't leave our song unsung. Mm. Um, we need to find a way to express that today, even in small ways. So first of all, you have to learn what your song is. And that's a lot of hard work. I think a lot of people don't do the work to do that. And that that's what uh, I think a coach can be really helpful with some self uh, reflection, somebody that can, can ask you the right questions and, and help you think through it. But um, so once you figure out what your song is, then it's a hard practice of learning how to sing your song every day, regardless of what your situation is. Some people think I'll be able to do more of that when I retire, or some people think, you know, I got to find the perfect job that can allow me to express that. But the truth is you really don't. We have so much time in our day to find opportunities to, to express that um, outside of work. You know, when you talk to people that are working, I, some people say 80 hours a week, I'm working 80 hours a week, 70 hours a week. If they were to really measure it, a lot of people aren't even close to that. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think they did a study and it was like the, the average or median was like 50 or something, which okay. makes more sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But if you take all that out, take all the sleeping out, take all the other essentials out, um, you still got a big chunk of time you know, mm. uh, close to 50 hours a week, uh, something like that. I don't remember that I have to do the math, but that you have at your discretion to be able to um, sing your song essentially. Uh -huh. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to discount anyone who's living uh, paycheck to paycheck that those base needs have to be met first. Right. Sure. So if you're working two or three jobs, it's a different story. If you've got kids that, you know, you're a single parent, things like that. I, I don't want to, to discount any of those situations, but once those basic needs are met, there are opportunities. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah. That's a, yeah, it's great. You've definitely had the, the life experience uh, to get that awareness and that perspective, uh, you know, that you need uh, to be successful at what you're doing and, and like walk the walk, have that congruency, right? Walk the walk, talk the talk. You've had these experiences that have, uh, brought these lasting sustainable changes within yourself. One other thing that you mentioned in there that I really appreciate. And, you know, you were talking about earlier about your coaching method of meeting people where they are. And I think that's why coaching is, is so effective is, um, you know, meeting people where they are. And it's just like small habits, right? When you meet somebody at the R yes, they could have a 10 year plan or they could have like a North star and that's great. Uh, but you know, the journey, especially when we're talking adventure is perfect. You know, the journey uh, up the mountain is like, you know, at the end of the day is one step at a time too. Right. So this like integrating, uh, you know, small habits that you don't necessarily need that like influx of motivation to complete. It's like, that way you can like, it's consistency over motivation, right? Because it's like a small enough habit that you can sustain it with consistency without something, you know, potentially fleeting like motivation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think kind of speaks to um, a core part of your audience here beyond recovery, yeah. people who are in that stage of like, okay, I feel like I've got a, a decent handle on this a recovery piece moving beyond the addictions. What's next, you know? And, and I think 100%. so much of that is like establishing and building these small daily habits that are positive habits, not negative habits. So not by positive and negative, I don't mean like it's good for you or bad for you. I mean, um, things that you are going to do versus things you aren't going to do. Yeah. Right? 
Uh, I like the yeah, I like the way of looking at that that. And I like how you tied it in, you know, as we're winding things down here with the uh the tie into the addiction and such. So I actually have um, you know, this this course that I teach as part of my curriculum. There is a lesson specifically on adventure. Uh and just the idea of like getting out of your environment because there's so many when you're uh, you have like an addiction of some form there's a lot of like visual cues and like your environment is so like, it's deeply rooted. It's like, I know where the beer stores are around my house. Like I've drank in pretty much every room in my house. So there's all these like memories and everything. So uh, for me, this is the novelty of adventure getting out and doing something that's out of your comfort zone is also stimulating in all the different ways that we talked about that nature is, uh, is such an important part it has been an important part for me and that's why i wanted to make sure to uh you know articulate that and and uh, express that to people and also exactly like the topics we've been talking about today adventure is going to be different for different people right not everybody's going to parachute out of a plane you're talking about the lady that uh you're renting an airbnb out in the woods in a cabin is going to be a huge adventure for her right so just figuring out where you are on that spectrum uh but just the idea that like man, uh, the outdoors and nature and everything combines so many different elements that uh, really tie in well with like, you know, addiction recovery and and such. Uh, and yeah, I'd love to get your take on it as we wrap things up here. Yeah. Uh, nature is such a powerful force in our lives. You know, that's where we come from. That's where we're going to go when we die. And <laughs> yeah. I think we're so disconnected from it in our modern world. And um, I work with uh, a lot of guys in particular, uh, in, in a volunteer organization that I work in. And I work as a leader in that organization. I'm a formal coach for them. I meet with them regularly. And some of them are in the midst and the, in the depths of some of these addictive habits. Most yeah. of them, you know, it's like porn and, and negative self-talk, things like this. But um, one of the things I, I do to get out of that like you said, that like visual stimuli or things like that. It's just, let's, let's go for a walk and let's just go for yeah. a walk and let's talk out in nature. I yeah. live, fortunately, I live somewhere where nature is right out my back door. Nice. Um, and I, I'm sure that's because I chose to do that because <laughs> yeah, uh, it's important to me, but I think everybody yeah. should find a way to get out in nature regularly. It's healing and it, it will help whatever junk you're going through in life. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and I like how you said that too. And like, that's why it's like, you know, I, obviously there's a focus on alcoholism because that's my experience, but at the end of the day, addictions, addictive behavior is, uh, you know, the mechanics of it is very similar, right? You know what I mean? It's like, you have a, this addictive, you know, part of you that is covering something up that you're, you're protecting or you're numbing or you're avoiding or you're escaping. Right. So the, the addiction in that sense, where again, that's what I'm glad you brought up, you know, there could be porn addiction. There could be just like mindset, like, uh, like negative, like sh shitting all over yourself all the time. Right. And just having that idea. And yeah. And just the idea that like, even when you're saying, get out into nature, saying that kind of sentence, like, I know what it does. So like, as you're saying that I'm feeling myself open. So really cool stuff. So Chris, Thanks so much for coming on the show. Before we leave, I wanted to give the opportunity to, if anybody's wanting to reach out to you, where can people find you online? And if you have anything, you know, coming up in the near future, whether it's another uh, enrollment or if you have, you know, a book or anything that you're working on, I'd love to, the floor is yours. So uh, yeah, where can we find you online? Yeah, I guess the best place is to hook me up on social media. My main platform I use is Instagram. Uh, the handle is not easy to say, but I'll, I'll describe it. it's adventure school, but the L is a one. So yeah. adventure school one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The number one. And, and that's just because that was what it was available. Um, yeah. My website is my adventure school.com. So you can go check that out. There's a ton of uh, adventure related material there, but there's also uh, links to my coaching. Um, so those are the two main platforms. I'm happy to connect with anybody through those. You can reach out and DM me on Instagram and I'll, I'll reply. Excellent. Yeah. And any plans for 2023? Do you have um, like, you're doing the one-on-ones? Are you looking to expand to group coach? Are you doing retreats? I'm just say, you know, <laughs> any, any, any big plans that you can, uh, you know, vaguely give some details. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'll whet the appetite a little bit. So one-on-one -on -one yeah. is my main uh, avenue right now because I, I just love the one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's a, a powerful format to help people. Group coaching will come down the road. Uh, not 
not quite there yet. But what I am working on right now is uh, kind of like an ebook manual, life manual, right? So all the I've got uh, six pillars that I teach in my program and coaching, and it's mindset. Um, let's see if I can remember them in order. Mindset, meaning, ministry, magic, memories, and money. So those six are, I'm, I'm writing an ebook about how to incorporate all of those in a healthy way into your life to create a life that's uh, really going to leave a lasting legacy and impact beyond yourself in a non-ego based way. Um, so that, that book's in under works right now, it'll be published and I'll, I'm sure I'll share that all over, but if you're interested in that, um, just follow me on Instagram, come to my webpage and you'll be up to date on, on when that's going to be released. Excellent. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And yeah, closer to the time that you have, that's, it sounds like an amazing, uh, you know, a book, like hand uh, manual, if you will. I like that idea quite a bit, the six, six M's. So uh, closer to, yeah, let's, uh, I'd love to do an Instagram live or have you come back on the show uh, or something now that we've, you know, we've got some rapport and such. So dude, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. This has been great.